in the Gospel of Mark at chapter 7. Mark at chapter number 7, verses 24 through verse number 30. I want to talk this morning about how an impossible request was granted. How an impossible request was granted. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demons out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Thank you. You may have your seats. The grass withers and the flower thereof fadeth away. But the word of our God shall stand forever. How an impossible request was granted. Does anyone in this church this morning or watching us online, does anyone in here today have a need in your life? I hazard the hunch that, that most of us have one or more major needs. And some may not see how your needs can be met. Some of us are looking at devastating family problems. Others are having financial difficulty. Maybe there are those here having a problem with your child. Still others are dealing with a debilitating disease and wondering what lies ahead. And perhaps you are looking after your parents or looking at your parents and you are realizing that they are getting older and they will not be here much longer. In the midst of your problem, you need some help. You need God to work a work in your life. You don't need him to lift every burden just the heaviest ones. He does not need to move every mountain, just the highest ones. You don't need a whole loaf, a crumb will do. Jesus and his disciples go to Tyre and Sidon, which is in the heart of Gentile territory. They try to get some rest from the pressures of ministry, but we are told in verse 24 in the King James, he could not be hid. Listen to that again. He could not be hid. Wherever Jesus is, he cannot be hid. 
If Christ is in you, he cannot be here. If he's in your home, if he's in your family, if, it, if, if he's in your life, wherever Christ shows up, if he's in you, you can try to hide it. You can try to act like you don't belong to him. You can be in a company of people who are lost and on their way to hell, but if you belong to Christ, there's something in your face that will mark you. And everybody around you will know you ain't got no business in here. You have no business trying to act like one of these people. Stop trying to act like a sinner. Stop trying to act like you're one of these people in the club. This is not where you belong because if Christ is in you, he's the hope of glory. And he cannot be hid. But in this text, a burdened mother, a heart sick mother, locates Jesus. She's in a desperate situation and she needs something in her life. She begins to petition him for the help that she needs and although she faces several challenges, she persists until she gets what she came for. Mark describes her generally as a Gentile woman, a Greek woman, and particularly as a Syrophoenician woman by race. According to Matthew's account of this incident, Jesus tests the woman by first ignoring her, giving her a bureaucratic response, and seemingly insulting her by calling her a dog. But brothers and sisters, I want you to hear me. There, there must have been something in Christ's look. There must have been something in his face or in the cadence of his voice which helped to soften the surface harshness of his words and embolden this woman to confront him with the plain implications of his own words. Our Lord's words, what Jesus said to this woman is startlingly unlike Jesus. Jesus always seems to want to help. But that the woman did not take offense to what he said was due not only to her faith, but because of the fact that what she needed was greater than what she felt to be an insult. She said, tell me what you want to tell. Call me what you want to call me. Say what you want to say. I ain't going nowhere until I get what I came for. This passion this, this, this narrative, this passionate woman, this passage gives us instruction on how we should approach prayer in our life. Faith, when it is real, faith, listen to me, when it is real, faith makes obstacles into opportunities. And stones of stumbling into stepping stones to higher things. Faith recognizes when we are at the end of our resources. And when we are at the end of our resources, there is no holding back. There's no attempt to dress up our prayer to make it sound more acceptable. Lord, I ain't going nowhere until you give me what I came for. Faith asks for what is humanly impossible, accepting the truth that nothing is impossible with God. Faith bids us to live in the context of a loving father who knows our needs, 
who carries our liabilities with unconditional love and who is at work within us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Walk with me around the text. In verses 25 and 26, we see this woman's request. Verse 25 and 26, we see this woman's request. The scripture says, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demons out of her daughter. Let, let, let me see if I can help us with this in this early morning hour. God will not answer 100% of the prayers you don't pray. I wish I had my 7.30 crowd here this morning. God will not answer 100% of the prayers you don't pray. The first thing we see about this woman is she came. She heard where Jesus was. She made her way there. She came. If, if you want your prayers answered, first thing you got to do is come. Um, stop, stop, stop acting like you got it all together. Stop acting like you don't need a help. You know, we, 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 we come to church with so many masks on. Not, not, not just for COVID. We mask our needs. We mask that we're doing all right when underneath there's a tempestuous storm. We act like we got it all together when the truth is, as soon as we get out of here and take all this stuff off, the real you shows up. And, and listen, brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm going to talk about it again in the next service. Nothing's wrong with you admitting that sometimes you just get mad with God. You just upset that God has not shown up yet. You've been praying, you've been fasting, you've been asking God to deliver, you've been hoping God would make a way and your next door neighbor who don't even go to church. Everything is going well in their life. Your children are acting a fool. Your husband is crazy. Your finances are bad. Everything is going wrong and you love God. You trust God. But things still don't seem to work out. But I dare you to come if you show up that's half the battle right there but not only she came when she got there she cried she said my daughter is vexed with the devil my daughter is full of the devil I can pray like that. Uh, some of you here can pray like that. My boy is full of the devil. My girl is full of the devil. I don't care how cute that little baby is. I don't care how frilly her little dress and how pretty you dress her up with a fascinator on her head. She's a devil. She got it from her mama. He got it from his daddy. I was born in sin. I wish I had a Bible reader. Shaped in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Every no good thing I know to do, I learned it at home. My daughter, Jesus, is vexed with an unclean spirit. A devil, a demon is troubling her. And listen, don't come to the Lord with, Lord, I need your help. Come to the Lord with what's going on. Lord, I need you to come to definitively handle this situation. I'm not praying for the sick and shut in right now. I'm not praying for those behind prison bars right now. 
I'm not praying for the United States. I'm not praying for the president. I'm not praying for the world. Lord, I need you to come in this mess I got in my life. Not my brother. I wish I had a witness. Not my sister. It's me, oh Lord. I need your help. I'm standing in the need of prayer. I'm about to lose my mind. Up in here. And when you come, and when you cry, here's the second thing. After she made her request, Matthew's gospel says, Jesus seemed to ignore this woman. He, 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 he seems not to want to be bothered with her. And when you read this account in Matthew, the disciples said, woman, go on. Go ahead now, you, you're a Gentile. You're a Syrophoenician woman. You have no business in this crowd. Go on about your business. But when you need Jesus badly enough, you don't care who's sitting by you. You don't care what they think about you. You don't care what's written about you on Facebook. You're not worried about anybody else's opinions. You're not worrying about anybody's definition or designation of you. As long as I get what I came for. And let me tell you what I came for this morning. I came for mercy. I came because I need forgiveness. I came because I need God to open some doors came because I need God to put down some mountains in my life. I came because I need God to strengthen me where I'm weak. In the language of my elders, I need him to build me up where I'm torn down. And if you don't need that, you just go right to sleep. But to those of us who need God right now, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw yourself from me, whither shall I go? Be proud if you want. Be cute if you want. But some of us in here need the Lord right now. We got some stuff to deal with this week. We've got some situation to handle when we get home. And if the Lord don't help us, if the Lord does not come through, if the Lord does not make a way, we don't know how we go. I will lift up my eye unto the hill. Where does my help come from? My help come from the Lord. Come on, you can help me say it. Who made the heavens and the earth. He will not even suffer my foot to be moved. Behold, he that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is my keeper. I wish I had one or two more witnesses. The Lord is the shade upon my right hand. The sun shall not smite me by day nor the moon by night for the Lord shall preserve me from all evil. He shall preserve my soul. He shall preserve my going out and my coming in. From this time forth, and even for when I wake up in the morning, he's there. When I go to bed at night, he's there. Uh, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't looking for this confirmation, but but I got it this morning. Brother Brother Wellington Armelon, who who handles the cameras and sound and everything here at the church. Brother Wellington Armelon came to my, to my study before I went out for consecration with the deacons. And he said, Pastor, I want to talk to you. I, we can talk later if you don't have time right now. I said, no, uh, lay it on me. He said, yesterday you were at the Chevron station across the street on, on Old Spanish Trail. And he said, I was across the street at the Exxon station. And he said, I was, I was watching you because you were putting gas in your car and leaning against the car, not paying attention. He said, there was a man behind you 
with a hoodie on taking pictures of you. He said, I had my eyes on him and I was ready to dart across the street. He said, you went into the building to pay for the gas perhaps and he said, uh, he went in the same time you went in. And he said, when you came out, you got in your car and left and I knew everything was all right. But he said, I want you to just be careful of your surroundings. And I thought about that coming in here to preach this morning. All night? All day? When you're not watching? Why should I feel discouraged? I wish I had a witness. Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely or long for heaven and home when Jesus is my push? A constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know, I wish I had some noise here. He's watching me at the gas station. He's watching me at the supermarket. He's watching me while I sleep at night. He's watching when my enemy has designs again. Fret not yourself. Because of evil doing. Neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. They shall soon be cut off like grass and wither like a green earth. There was a man behind me, but there was a man above me. Won't he do it? He'll make your enemy leave you alone. He'll protect you till your hair turns gray. He'll make a way out of no way. But you gotta come and you gotta cry. Yeah. But now, as we move from her request, I want you to, as I hurry, I want you to see her resolve. The woman had to overcome some resistance to her request to secure her daughter's healing. Yet, she persisted till she got where she came from. She had to overcome the obstacle of race. She was a Canaanite. She was from a cursed race. Because when you read the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord told Joshua and the children of Israel to go into the land and destroy the cursed Canaanites. She was from a cursed race. And then this woman was from a pagan religion. She had to overcome race, but not only did she have to overcome race, she had to overcome the religion that she came from. A Gentile woman crying out to a Jewish Messiah. A Gentile woman, a pagan woman crying out to a Jewish Messiah. But then, after overcoming race and religion, she had to overcome what was seemingly Jesus' rejection. Because the woman said, my daughter is vexed with the devil. I need you to heal her. And Jesus said to this woman, let the children first be fed. Let the Jews eat first because he said, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The children of Israel ought to eat first. And that first distinctly says that the Jews have a priority, but they don't have a monopoly. Y'all missed that. 
The Jews have a priority, but they don't have a monopoly. I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but if they don't want to hear me, they don't have a monopoly on the gospel. And, and, and brothers and sisters, I want to get this over to us. I'm going I'm I'm to teach you about it here later on in a, in a couple of weeks. But the Jews in Israel who are misusing the people of Gaza are not the Jews of the scripture. And the United States and other governments around the world are complicit in this genocide that's going on in Palestine thinking that we have to stand with the Jews even when they're wrong. They have a priority, but they don't have a monopoly. Because God is not just the God of the Jews. Because if that were the case, I would be lost this morning. Somebody ought to help me talk here. God is a God of every, whosoever wills, let him come and drink from the fountain of life freely. But now here, 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 here's the point I'm trying to make. He says the Jews, the children, ought to eat their bread first. But in scripture, there is what I want to call a dynamic symmetry. If there is a first, then by necessity, there has to be a second. If there is an up, there has to be a down. If there's a right, there has to be a wrong. If there's a good, there has to be an evil. So the woman is saying, I don't care nothing about them eating first. You got some seconds? Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me talk to somebody here who can cook. Red beans and rice are good when you're first cooking, but it ain't nothing like eating them the second day. is good when you're first cooking but when the seasoning settles in overnight and you take it out of the refrigerator and put it on a slow simmer and then it starts bubbling up at the top it's better the second day I don't care who gets served first just give me some seconds need a whole loaf of bread just let some crumbs fall from the table Lord you don't have to move the mountain just give me strength to climb it uh, this this woman says I know she says yes Lord let the children eat their bread first. But don't some crumbs fall from the table? I want you to understand this. When Jesus says it's not meat to give the children's bread to dogs, Jesus is not being as harsh as his Jewish counterparts. Because the Pharisees and the scribes and the Jewish people called Gentiles dogs. Mangy curs, mongrels, filthy dogs. A Jewish person would not let their garments be soiled with dust in Gentile regions. When they walked through Tyre and Sidon, they picked up their skirts so as not to get dust from Gentile ground on their clothes. When Jesus told that story about a certain Samaritan, if that, Jews, if that Jew that was helped by that Samaritan had been conscious, he never would have let that Samaritan help him. Because the Jews and the Samaritans have no dealing. 
when Jesus was at the well. He asked that woman for a drink. That woman said, how can you be asking me of a drink when I am a woman of Samaria? You know the Jews and the Samaritans have no dealing. You know Jews and Gentiles don't get along. The problem stems from Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Ishmael and Isaac, the Arabs and the Palestinians, the Jews and the Muslims, those problems started with Abraham lying when he went to Egypt. And they continue until this day from a dysfunctional family situation. And this woman, this, this Gentile woman, Jesus said, it's not meat for me to give the children's bread to dogs. He was not calling her a mangy, filthy dog. That's not that's not the interpretation of this text. Jesus is saying, it's not meat to give the children's bread to little puppies under the table. It's not right for the children's bread to come to little puppies under the table first. The woman says, I know. You ain't telling me nothing, I don't know. But don't some crumbs fall from the table anybody in here got, got a dog or had a dog or you, you got a little dog with you you just gave him his puppy child you just gave him his milk bone dog treat he's had his water he's peed he's done everything he needs to do and then you get ready to sit down to your meal and he sits right there, yeah. Yeah. licking his chops, yeah. waiting for some crumbs. Yeah. Somebody ought to help me talk here. Yes. That woman said, Lord, I'm going to stand right here because I know it's some bread on that table. Yeah. And sooner or later, some crumbs are going to fall from that table. And that's why I come to church every Sunday morning. That's why I give God glory. That's why I raise my hands in the sanctuary. Because sooner or later, some crumbs are going to fall from that table. And I'm so grateful to God that I don't need a whole loaf. I just need some crumbs. Some of y'all can't shout because you're waiting on a whole loaf. But some of us here just glad to be in the service one more time. Um, I'm through. But now, that woman stayed there until Jesus said, I have not seen this kind of faith, not even in Israel. A Syrophoenician, a Gentile, a pagan, a dog got more faith than a Pharisee. More faith than a church member. More faith than a choir member. More faith than a deacon at Lily Grove. More faith than an usher because she said, I don't care what you call me. I ain't going nowhere until you bless me. And brothers and sisters, somebody here whose back has been up against the wall, somebody here who don't know which way to turn when life has really messed you up you say to him Lord I ain't going nowhere I'm staying right here come hell or high water until you answer my request Jesus was amazed by her faith her reward was she stayed right there and brothers and sisters listen to me Jesus may give you this morning what you've been hoping for 27 years. Can I give you an acronym for the word hope? Hope, H-O-P-E. Hold on, P. 
pain ends. I know it looks dark. I know it seems impossible. I know the situation seems to be insurmountable, but hold on. Pain ends. Today might be the day when Jesus responds to your cry. Today might be the day when God speaks in your soul to let you know that everything is going to be all right. You may be saying this morning, but pastor, you don't understand how big my problem is. No, I don't. But God does. Look with me for a few minutes as I close at what God can do. Jairus' little daughter was at the point of death. And he came to Jesus and said, if you come and put your hands on her, she will be healed and she will live. And the Bible says Jesus went with him. On the way, a woman with an issue of blood grabbed his clothes and Jesus stopped. And when he stopped, the blood stopped. And he said, somebody touched me. Peter said, Lord, all these people around here, somebody's bound to have touched you. He said, no, I felt virtue. I felt power run out of me. And that little woman said, I touched you. And Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. But that seemed to delay him going to Jairus' house. Yeah. And when he got there, the professional mourners were there, weeping and wailing. And they said to Jesus, it's too late. And Jesus told Jairus to put all these people out. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, Jairus and his wife, because if God is going to work, he needs an atmosphere of belief. He took her by the hand. She came back to life. And he said, give her something to eat. Lazarus had been dead four days. And Mary and Martha said, if you had to come when we called you, my brother would still be alive. Jesus said, you're going to see your brother again. Martha said, I know I'm going to see him in the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he be dead, yet shall he live. And he that lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? The multitude were out there with no food. That was a little boy with two fish and five loaves. Jesus lifted it up to his father and gave it to his disciples and fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. God can do anything. The disciples are in a storm. And they say, Master, don't you care that we are about to perish? Jesus wipes sleep from his eyes, gets on board that ship, and says, Peace, be still. And they say, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. A man was in the tombs, cutting himself with stones. Could not be bound with fetters and chains, but he met Jesus. And when Jesus got through with him, he was clothed and in his right mind. God can do anything. One Friday on a hill called Calvary. Jesus died and looked like he was finished. He stayed in the grave all night Friday and all day Saturday, but God can do anything. Early Sunday morning, God raised him from the dead. And if God can do that then, God can do it right now. He's a problem solver. He's a burden bearer. He's a heavy load sharer. What is impossible with man is possible with God. That's how an impossible request was granted.